Hi, I'm Moritz Lapsche. I'm one of the orthopedic surgeons at the Department of Orthopedics of Ritter at UCT. And today we'll do a case-based discussion um, looking at some cases of common upper limb fractures and dislocations. The first case to discuss is a common injury in our active population. This is a case of a 19-year-old male that fell off his mountain bike and sustained this right-sided clavicle fracture. If you look at the uh, x-ray, you can describe this as a mid-shaft clavicle fracture that is significantly displaced. And there is some comminution at the fracture side. You see that there's more than one fragment. And you can make out on the outline of the soft tissue here that um, the fracture end of the medial piece is very close to the skin surface. What we are dealing with here is a displaced comminuted mid shaft clavicle fracture. Um, what is important on clinical examination is a local examination of the status of the soft tissue, making sure this is not an open fracture. Um, and also to see if there's signs of threatening of the skin um, with imminent puncture of the skin, or sometimes the skin is puckered over the medial piece and the skin is not mobile over this area. And these are cases that's at risk of the um, fragment eroding through the skin. It is useful, even for general practitioners, to know the classification of clavicle fractures by Allman divided into three different groups. Group one is um, by far the most common, which is mid sharp clavicle fractures. The vast majority of these can be treated non operatively, successfully, even displaced ones, only highly displaced ones with more than a hundred percent translation and shortening more than two centimeters um, needs to be reviewed semi-urgently by an orthopedic surgeon. Group two injuries, on the other hand, these are the lateral third of the clavicle fracture. There's a higher um, complication rate if they are displaced and treated non-operatively. So only very minimally displaced and undisplaced fractures are treated non-operatively. So I would say all Group two or lateral third clavicle fractures should be referred to an orthopedic surgeon. And then lastly, group three fractures or the medial third fractures. These are an indication of high energy trauma. And these almost never require surgical fixation, but it's very important here to rule out other life threatening chest injuries. In this specific case, there was imminent uh, skin threatening, so the skin was sort of puckered uh, over that fracture and not mobile, and uh, we proceeded to treat the fracture with open reduction and internal fixation with a plate, as you can see here from the post-op x-rays. So what is important um, in managing these injuries, as we said, uh, in both a local examination of the local soft tissue, but also a neurovascular examination of the limb. Immediate treatment is just immobilization of the limb, which can either be with the use of a collar and cuff, a broad arm sling or triangular bandage or a shoulder immobilizer. Um, it often assists the patient if there's some support under the elbow um, to reduce the effect of gravity from the arm on the lateral end of the of the clavicle. Then when to refer clavicle fractures? Well, any case with um, skin or neurovascular compromise or imminent uh, skin compromise should be referred to an orthopedic service immediately. All other cases can be immobilized and referred to an orthopedic service to be reviewed in seven to 10 days, um, especially in a sort of a public health scenario. Only highly displaced middle third clavicle fractures 
and all lateral third clavicle fractures need to be referred by orthopedics and other mid-shelf clavicle fractures can be treated at primary care level. The next case is that of a 50-year-old male that slipped and fell and injured his left shoulder. As you can see here on the series of x-rays, he sustained a lateral third clavicle fracture that is minimally displaced. Important to note here that for injuries around the shoulder, we prefer three different views. As you can see here, a AP view, a scapular lateral view, and a modified axillary view. You can see from this x-ray that the fracture was successfully treated non-operatively and united in a satisfactory position. It's important to note on the x-ray that the fracture involved the lateral third of the clavicle. In this case, it was undisplaced or minimally displaced because the coracoclavicular ligaments or CC ligaments that run here were intact and it prevented the medial part of the clavicle, which is here, to displace in cases where the CC ligaments are ruptured with the lateral end clavicle fracture, the medial end of the clavicle migrates proximally and leads to displacement. As I've mentioned before, all cases of lateral third clavicle fracture should be referred to an orthopedic surgeon. The next case is an example of a 20-year-old male rugby injury that injured his left shoulder playing rugby and presents with an anterior dislocation of his glenohumeral joint. You can see on the series of x-rays there that there's an anterior dislocation of the shoulder. Um, on the modified axillary view here, you can see the glenoid and the humeral head should usually be sitting here and um, it's dislocated anterior towards the towards the ribcage. Also important to note here is that there's a small impression fracture uh, where the humeral head is pushing against the glenoid and that is called a heel sex lesion. The dislocation was reduced in the ER and you can see here that the post-reduction x-rays confirm a concentric reduction <clears throat> with the humeral head in a good position. This is another example of a shoulder dislocation of an older patient, 56 year old. You can see here again that there's an anterior dislocation of the um, humeral head, this time with a fracture of, a great, of the greater tuberosity. This is a common associated fracture with a um, anterior shoulder dislocation. It does not change the initial management of the case and um, the fracture should be reduced, the dislocation should be reduced urgently in the front room um, with the same technique. We advocate the use of the modified mulch technique for a gentle reduction of an of a anterior shoulder dislocation. The only contraindication for uh, attempted reduction at the unit of presentation would be if there's a surgical neck, surgical neck fracture, so fracture dislocation of the humeral head where the head is dislocated but the shaft is back in position. And as you can see here on the post-reduction film, this often happens and that with reduction of the humeral head, the greater tuberosity fragments fall, falls back into place. And if this is the case, we still treat the patient non-operatively, but we watch them closely uh, for the displacement of the greater tuberosity fragments. Um, these cases with associated fracture should be referred to an orthopedic uh, surgeon in the acute setting. So once you've reduced the simple dislocation, the patient's shoulder can be immobilized for a short period of two to three weeks, and you should re-examine the patient to rule out associated complications. The common complications associated with a shoulder dislocation is in the young patients, especially athletes, they are more prone to develop recurrent dislocations of the shoulders. Older patients, uh, more commonly, have associated rotator cuff tears, so it's very important to examine them at two to three weeks to look at their strength and to decide whether you suspect that there might be an associated rotator cuff tear. 
data cuff tear. So when should refer a shoulder dislocation to an orthopedic surgeon? Well, the first dislocation in a contact athlete should be relevant in a rugby player, especially someone that wishes to return to playing rugby. Even one dislocation often justifies a stabilization procedure. Any patient with recurrent dislocation of his shoulder should be referred or cases with associated fractures or suspected associated rotator cuff tears should be referred acutely as well. So the learning points here is, is adequate initial management, including reduction of, of um, dislocations, even with associated fractures, as long as there's no surgical neck fracture, and also to know when to refer patients with shoulder dislocations. The next case is that of a 70-year-old that slipped and fell and injured her left shoulder, and she presents with this um, proximal humerus fracture. As you can see, the proximal humerus fracture is what we call a two-part fracture. In other words, there's just two parts, the humeral head and then the shaft. Um, you can see on the modified axillary view that the humeral head is not dislocated. There's some comminution at the um, fracture site, and if you have to describe the displacement, you can say that there's some various angulation um, of this injury. So this was the initial management in the emergency room. Just to note that use slabs are um, for the immobilization of humeral shaft fractures, and they often make the displacement of proximal humerus fractures worse. For a proximal humerus fracture, we simply need a collar and cuff or shoulder immobilizer worn against the patient's body, initially with either a body bandage or just underneath the patient's clothes. So like I said, initially we um, prefer not to have a use slab in uh, proximal humerus fractures. In proximal humerus fractures, especially in the elderly patients, almost any position is acceptable. You can um, tolerate a high degree of angulation because the um, shoulder is such a joint with such um, high movement and um, only really fractures that is completely off-ended um, we would consider surgery or more importantly in cases where one of the tuberosities, the greater or the lesser tuberosity, is markedly displaced because in these cases the attachment of the rotator cuff is compromised and this can severely compromise function if not treated operatively. So when to refer all um, Proximal humerus fractures can initially be treated with collar and cuff or sling, except for if there's an associated dislocation, and it can be referred to an orthopedic um, fracture clinic to be reviewed within seven to ten days. As you can see here, the patient is in a shoulder immobilizer. The position is slightly improved by the effect of gravity. And this is an acceptable position for a proximal humerus fracture. And here's the same patient a few weeks later with a united fracture in some various, but in elderly lower demand patients, that doesn't necessarily equate to a functional deficit. So remember, USLAP is for humeral shaft fractures, almost always non-operative management of proximal humerus fractures. And very important to note uh, that we should also always think of osteoporosis workup in any patient with a fragility fracture. The definition of a fragility fracture is a fall from a standing height. Now, we've become quite good at picking up osteoporosis when patients present with hip fractures, but on average, upper limb fragility fractures um, occur 10 to 15 years earlier than fragility hip fractures. So it's really actually the time that we should be picking up these patients and investigating them and diagnosing osteoporosis because appropriate treatment at this stage can prevent further devastating complications like neck or femur fractures in the future. This is an example of a 78-year-old woman that fell from a standing height and sustained this right humeral shaft fracture. You can see that it's an oblique fracture or a short spiral fracture. It's in reasonable alignment with some um, translation, but minimal, ang minimal angulation. Initially, it was placed in the use lab in the emergency room. 
and the patient consulted um, me a week later. Is the position acceptable? Well, again, you can accept quite significant displacement in the humeral shard fracture. You can accept up to 30 degrees of angulation in a mid shard humeral fracture. Of course, the shoulder is such a multi axial joint, you, you, um, you can not really be compromised for your activities of daily living, even with a high degree of um, angulation. When to refer, well, all humeral shaft fractures should be seen in a fracture clinic seven to ten days after the initial injury, unless there's a, unless it's an open fracture or there's a neurovascular compromise, they should be referred more urgently. Again, think of fragility fractures in someone that falls from a standing height, and you should consider osteoporosis workup. So this is the patient treated in what's called a Sarmiento brace or removable humeral brace. You can see that there's some translation at the fracture site, but uh, an, an adequate alignment, and the patient is treated like that um, to union, as you can see here, with lots of callus formation and the fracture almost completely united in a good position. So remember again, humeral shaft fractures are mostly treated non-operatively, and don't forget about fragility fracture work workup. Mostly, when we fix humeral shaft fractures, it's because of patient factors. There's a patient with an associated lower limb fracture that needs to use crutches, or an active patient that needs to be back at work quite quite quicker. But the outcome of treatment non-operatively with a brace is the same as as the long-term outcome with operative management. This is an example of a 32-year-old female that's involved in an MVA and sustained a both bone forearm fracture. Initially, it was placed in a back slab or two-sided slab by the emergency room and referred to orthopedics. So um, there's no real debate on whether the position is acceptable. All adult both bone forearm fractures are treated operatively. The forearm is... Uh, a complex um, joint in effect really with multiple muscle forces acting on it and very difficult to um, sustain an acceptable position. So all both bone forearm fractures should be referred to orthopedic um, surgeon for surgery. Um, if it's an open fracture on neurovascular compromise or compartment syndrome immediately or urgently, or um, if it's a closed fracture to the next available fracture clinic. And here you can see the post-op x-ray of the patient treated operatively with a plate and screws. So remember the treatment for both bone forearm fractures in the vast majority of cases in adults is always operative. This is another example of a common injury in our active population. This is a 28-year-old uh, male patient that fell from a height and injured his left wrist. You can see that this is a significantly displayed distal radius fracture. Important to note on this x-ray is that you can see the apex volar angulation with the sharp bony spike and you can just imagine the median nerve runs uh, at a sharp angle around the sh uh, sharp bone spike and this is why even if this case is going to be managed um, non-operatively it is very important um, to have an urgent reduction and application of a back slab in the emergency unit by the doctor attending to them. Even if the position is not perfect, it needs to be improved from this position to prevent uh, neurological compromise. So the initial management is under sedation, a reduction and a volar slab. You can see this is the post-reduction x-ray. You can now better see the x-ray, the um, injury. But this is a complex uh, fracture with intraarticular extension on the lateral there. That you, can see, you can see that the position is greatly improved. There's still some apex volar angulation. So this is not an acceptable position. We will still improve this with definitive management. But this is now good enough to wait for further treatment. So to decide on the further management, we need to decide whether this um, uh, injury is in an acceptable position or not. And here we use what's called the rule of 11s. So on the AP view, the tip of the radial styloid should be 11 millimeters more distal than the tip of the ulnar styloid. If this distance is decreased, it, it indicates that there's some shortening 
and the radial inclination angle is 11 times 2 or 22 degrees and also indicates shortening if it's decreased. In a young active person you want to restore near normal anatomy in older people you can accept up to 5 millimeters of shortening. In the lateral view um, there should normally be an 11 degrees AP volar um, tilt of the, of the radiocarpal joint. Um, now you can accept dorsal tilt of up to neutral, um, but more than that or more dorsal tilt than to neutral um, should compromise range of motion of the, of the wrist. So this, here you can see the case was treated operatively with a plate and screws to improve the position to those acceptable parameters. And this is the final x-ray with union of the fracture. So important here is the initial management, even if the patient is going to have operative fixation, needs an urgent reduction and application of a backslab to improve the position. And it's important to know the acceptable position because undisplaced fractures or fractures in acceptable position can be successfully treated at primary care level. Thank you very much. That's all from me for today.